Thank you for watching Discover Northern Kentucky. Today we will visit the Boone County Public Library Main Branch for the reenactment of Mary Draper Angles. Years before the United States was born, a small pioneer settlement in the colony of Virginia was established called Draper's Meadow. Now, William and Mary Draper lived there with their two young sons. Next door in another roughly built cabin was her widow mother, Eleanor. Mary's brother Johnny and his wife Bet and their wee infant also lived in this settlement. Now some of the folks in Draper's Meadow spoke English, some German, but they all were good friends who had worked together to clear the land, build their cabins, and plant their crops. And although the Indians lived close by, they, the settlers had existed during years of peaceful coexistence. Now it was 1755, and there were distant rumblings of war heard throughout the land. For you see, the British colonists were upset because French soldiers from Canada were trying to control these lands west of the Allegheny Mountains, lands which England had previously claimed as her own. And the settlers, many of them, had already cleared the land and built their cabins and settled their families. They didn't want to give them up and go back east over the Blue Ridge. France had recruited many of the Indian tribes, and the French were offering handsome rewards for every scalp, every man's, woman's, and child's. Well, you see, the French and Indian War began between France and England because the countries could not solve their many differences peacefully. The French and the Indians joined to fight against the British and the colonists here in what would be the United States. Well, King George III of England had sent over a thousand British troops to the colonies to ensure the safety of the settlements. General Edward Braddock had commanded an attack against the French and the Indians. Young Colonel George Washington was under Braddock's command. Washington had two white stallions shot out from beneath him, but he suffered nary a scratch. The Indians claimed Washington was protected by magic. Well, Braddock was defeated, and Fort Duquesne was burned to the ground many settlers massacred. Bands of angry Shawnees swarmed out over the land into the Ohio Valley, armed and looking for scouts. Many, many settlers were murdered or taken hostage by these Indians. Settlements were burned, crops destroyed, valuables plundered. Well, Colonel Washington was sent to build forts along the Blue Ridge and to enlist what were called volunteers, which were settlers who were willing to come and man these forts to help protect the settlements. Well, only a handful of volunteers had been raised when a surveyor by the name of Colonel Patton arrived in Draper's Meadow. He was expecting to find the settlement abandoned with the settlers having moved back east over the Alleghenies. Imagine his surprise when he found the cabins 
occupied, the settlers going busily about getting ready to harvest their crops for the winter. Saturday evening, July 7, 1755. Worried families had gathered around the fireplace in the Ingalls cabin to sing songs from their homelands, tell stories, read chapters from the Bible. Outside, in the darkness, painted faces watched and waited. And this is where my story begins. My name is Mary Draper Engels, and I am so glad that you've come to my log cabin here on the banks of the New River to hear my story about following the river back home. Now, I'm an 83-year-old widow woman. My husband, William, who built the ferry here across the New River, has been dead many years. But whenever my children or my grandchildren or neighbors such as yourself would come and ask me to tell my story about escaping from the Shawnee and following the river, back home here to, Drape, to Draper's Meadow, Virginia, I'm always pleased to share that story. And that's what I'd like to do this evening. You see, my story starts out in 1748, when my mom, Eleanor, and my father, George, brought my brother, Johnny, and I west over the Allegheny Mountains from Philadelphia here to the Blue Ridge. They were looking for a better life for themselves and their children, and they and other people moved west and settled in a little colony called Draper's Meadow, Virginia, right in the shadow of the Blue Ridge. In 1750, I marry the handsomest and only bachelor here in Draper's Meadow, <laughs> Will Ingalls. We were the first white couple to wed west of the Allegheny. Now in 1755, we had two healthy sons, Thomas, age four, and Georgie, age two and another babe do any day now. This Sunday morning, July 7th, 1755, no different than a thousand other days that have rolled here across the Blue Ridge. Hot, humid, nary a breeze stirring. Will had said to me early that morning, Mary, Johnny and I will be gone all day, down over the hills, getting in the corn crop. Oh, Will, I said, I'd be afraid. <coughs> Isn't the babe about to come, he asked. No, I just have this feeling that he shouldn't be going out there. Now, Mary, said Will, you know that Johnny and I have got to get the corn in. It's going to be wintertime soon. We'll need to get the harvest in. Look, he said, and he pointed to his rifle hung over the fireplace. If you need me, take down that rifle and shoot, shoot out the front door here, and I'll hear you, and I'll come running. So with those words, he and Johnny, took off down the hills. I knew they'd be gone down in the cornfields all day. Well, I sat there thinking about 
the settlers and what we talked about last night about Roman bands of engines that had come through Draper's Meadow, but their faces hadn't been painted for war. They were just moving on west to the hunting grounds. All of a sudden, I heard a noise out front. Slap, 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 and I smiled to myself. That would be me, sister-in-law Betty, dearer than any blood sister to me. She was already out there with a load of clothes and her fly soap washing Johnny's clothes there in the creek that ran through the middle of Draper's Meadow. I was there at the birthing of their wee baby boy last spring. You see, Johnny had gone back over the mountains last year and married Bet and brought her back here. I'll go out and join her. With the boys and Will playing as hard as they worked and working as hard as they played, there was always washing to do. So I grabbed up my lye soap and a bundle of clothes and walked out to the edge of the porch and dropped everything. There, peeking out from behind every cabin, was engine faces, painted for war. <clears throat> Bet looked up from her washing, just in time to see old Casper Farger, he was a widower in the settlement, shot through with an arrow. He fell dead right in the crick in front of her. Harry! Mary! How? Agent! She cried and she raced off toward her cabin where her sleeping baby boy was asleep in his cradle on the front porch. She scooped him up and ran out the back door of the cabin. I saw an engine aim his musket. Shoot! and the musket ball broke her right arm. She dropped her babe. She and I both watched in horror as they tossed him back and forth like a football, finally breaking his wee head on the edge of the cabin. I heard me mum in the blackberry patch. She'd been teaching me boys the 10 by 10 by 10 song. Do you all know it? I smiled because she had taught me brother Johnny and I the same song. I, Tommy lad, now pretend that you're in a boat and it's 10 by 10 by 10 times away in a land called Ireland, I had heard him say, aye, lad, Ireland. And then suppose that you came in that boat ten by ten by ten times as far to a land called Virginia, he answered. And I had smiled earlier when I had heard that. Now I heard me mum whisper to the boys, engines, engines, you boys don't make a sound and you stay here low in this blackberry patch. I saw her race out of that patch, clawing the <coughs> eyes out of one of the engines before she was felled by one of their tomahawks. She was scalped and her gray hair stuck to the waistband of one of them pieces. Bet and I watched as the Indians went into Colonel Patton, the surveyor's cabin. He'd been sitting there at his desk writing, and when the shadow of one of them heathens standing in the front door of the cabin, cast a shadow over his papers, he looked up, jumped, and reached for his musket. 
he was able to shoot one of them before they felled him with a tomahawk blow. One by one, the survivors were brought into the middle of the clearing. Henry Leonard, a thick leather thong around his throat, was forced to carry all the plunder them engines was stealing from us. Our blankets, our silver, even our cooking pot. <coughs> Beth stood there, her right arm bloodied and hanging loose at her side. The boys, Tommy and Georgie, had been discovered by the engines in the blackberry patch, and they were there with me. We watched as our cabins were torched. Then we was forced to walk down the path, outside the clearing, and on our way. Would we be slaves, I wondered? Would we be killed? Would we be ransomed? I knew not. Will had heard the gunshots, and he came running up just in time to see all of us gathered in the middle of the clearing and then, then being led away by the Indian War Party. He peeked around the side of Casper Barger's cabin just in time to meet two engines coming out of the cabin with their arms laden with our valuables, silver and blankets and weapons and cooking pots. The engines, seeing another scout that they could get, dropped their plunder and took off after him. Will raced back toward the woods. Mustn't leave them down the hill toward Johnny, he thought. He doesn't have a gun either. I'll veer off here into the woods. One engine went this way, one went this way, with Will running right in between them. He was a fast runner, but so was they. They was gaining on him, when all of a sudden, my Will tripped over a log that had been buried by a last year's leaves. And he went head over heels, head over heels, head over heels, falling down the hillside, finally coming to rest in a pile of last year's leaves. The engines was so intent upon collecting another scalp that they ran right by him and off down into the woods. Will lay there until he felt it was safe to double back and tell Johnny what had happened. Both men came back up to the settlement there at Draper's Meadow just in time to see the cabin burning to the ground. They had no weapons. The horses had been taken by the war party. All the men could do was sink to their knees and say a prayer for the safety of their families. One by one, they walked around. They found Johnny's baby boy. They found me mom, Eleanor. They found Casper Barger. Well, we traveled hard that first day. I was allowed to ride on horseback with Bet sitting behind me. The two boys, thank goodness they weren't crybabies, were quiet, sitting in front. At the end of that first day, we'd reached the new river. And I, I pantomimed to Chief Wildcat, who was the leader of this war party, that I wanted to go into the woods and get some comfrey leaves so I could make a poultice, make a bandage for Bet's arm. And he looked at me for a moment, and then he motioned that I could go. So 
So I gathered as many leaves as I could hold in my apron, and I brought them back and ripped some strips from my skirt and bandaged Bet's arm, and I whispered to her as I worked, Bet, you mustn't show them that we're afraid. To be afraid is to die. Mary, she said, I'll see them heathen burn in hell. They killed my family, and they killed your mother. Shh, bet, bite your tongue. Three days later, our hard traveling on horseback brought on my labor. And I vowed that I would not cry out in pain and let them engines see that I was hurting. Well, Bet helped me with the birth as best she could with but one good arm. Finally, my baby girl was born. Oh, Mary, said Bet. It's a wee Jill, and oh, look, as we wrapped her in our aprons. Already, she has a mosquito bite on her forehead. What will you name her, Bet asked. Oh, Will, I thought to myself, what shall we name this precious child, our first girl child? Betty, I said, for me dear sister, and Eleanor, for me mom. Betty, Eleanor. Well, the next morning, as we prepared to get on the horse and begin yet another day of hard travel, I looked over at the Shawnee Braves that were still sitting around their campfire. <clears throat> Chief Wildcat was walking around in a most peculiar way. And as I watched, <clears throat> this is what I heard. Oh! Oh! were all laughing. Finally, he stopped, stood up straight, and pointed right at me. Usa, good mother, brave mother. Well, I thought, I guess I had impressed him by not crying out at the birthing of my babe. Seven days later, we had reached the Kanawha River. It was like I had been riding in a trance. I remembered that the husband Will had said, Mary, to be lost in the woods is to die. I motioned to Wildcat, who I noticed had taken me mum's wooden sewing box for his own. And when I saw that box in his hand, a Pain rent my heart. I was an orphan. I motioned to the box and made sewing motions. Our clothes were in tatters. He looked me in the eye, <laughs> thought for a moment, and then motioned one of his braves to bring the box to me. I took out a length of yarn, and the next time that I could
could whisper to Beth and Mr. Leonard, I said, how long, how long do you think we've been on the trail, Mr. Leonard? Well, Mary, I expect it's been about seven days. So I tied seven knots in my rope belt. One knot for each day we've been traveling. And every morning thereafter, before I got up off that ground that was my bed, I would tie another knot in that yarn and look behind me for landmarks to see where we'd come. For to be lost in these woods was to die. At the banks of the Canal River, Bet and I were forced to boil pot after pot after pot of salty water until the water was all gone and nothing but the white salty brine was left. They was making good use of our best cook pots. Then the engines would take that salty brine and crumple it between the slabs of deer meat that they had butchered, wrapping everything up in blankets to be lashed behind on their horse backs. That would be their winter food. Four weeks later, we reached Shawnee Town, the mouth of the Scioto River. We're in their world now, Bet, I whispered. Be brave. We were tied to stakes there in Shawnee Town, next to other prisoners. Next to me was a great, gray-haired woman, taller than most men. As I looked over, she mumbled, rat, rat, rat. and then she turned to me and said, Are you angry? Well, dear, I answered, more afraid than angry. No, 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 she said, angry, angry, and she rubbed her great <coughs> belly. Oh, hungry. Yes, I am hungry, too. Bah, from you, she asked. Trainers Man of Virginia. Have you heard of it? No. And you, I ask? For Duquesne, my Henry Kitt. General Braddock, kilt, all kilt. Ah, Fort Duquesne. We had heard of the massacre from settlers passing through Draper's Meadow earlier <coughs> that summer. Well, guess what? What do you suppose will happen next, I ask? Well, Mary Ingalls, I hope it is supper, she replied. The next morning, we prisoners were forced to run the gauntlet. Two lines of Indians armed with briars and sticks and limbs and anything they could find that they could hit us about the head and shoulders with. One by one, the prisoners raced down the gauntlet. If they made it to the end, to the chieftain's lodge, 